Welcome everybody. So we want I want to talk about another exception that can handle the simplex method, which is called degeneracy. I'll talk more about why it's called that as we go. So pretend we're given this linear program, maximize x2, subject to these constraints, along with my non-negativity constraints. The first step is to put it in equational form. So I want my inequalities, besides the non-negativity ones, to be equalities. And I do that by introducing slack variables. So I want negative x1 plus x2 plus x3. That's the slack. It's now be equal to 0. And x1 plus x4 to now be equal to 2. x4 is the slack in the prior equation. And now, all four of my variables, including the two new slack ones, are not negative. Once you're in equational form, you can put it in the simplex tableau. Um, we see in the corresponding matrix that these two columns for x3 and x4 are linearly independent, right? The matrix that we're looking at is negative 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0, 1. Those are the coefficients coming from here. And these two columns for x3 and x4 are linearly independent. So let's make those our, our first feasible basis. So I've solved for x3. It is... Quick question, Henry. Yeah, Kyle. So on the left here, our constraints are less than or equal to zero and less than or equal to two. Should we be subtracting mm -hmm. our slack variables? Um, no, I would say not because, um, let's look at this one. So x1 is at most two. So x1 plus some non-negative number, x4, is going to be equal to two. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> My bad. No worries. All right. So I solve for x3, and I get x3 is equal to x1 minus x2. That's it. But let me give myself some more space for the constant. And then I solve for x4. x4 is 2 minus x1. And I'm just maximizing um, x2. Since x2 is already written in terms of one of my non-basic variables, x2, I can just um, drag my optimization function down. OK. Um, yeah. Could we have picked uh, x2 and x4 on our? OK, great. Totally. Emily's totally right. Um, Emily is noticing that x2 and x4 are um, correspond to linearly independent columns. So we could have chosen those. Um, let's see. We also could have chosen like x1 and x4 or x1 and x3. I think the only pair we couldn't have chosen was x2 and x3 because those are dependent, right? But any other choice of two columns would be uh, linearly independent columns. Emily, the reason why we chose x3 and x4 is just that, um, I don't know, whenever you have this identity matrix here, it's just easy, really easy to put them on the side by their own. So once we have our tableau, we need to decide what variable are we going to pivot over. We're going to pivot over x2. We're going to make x2 larger so we can do better in our optimization function. Which is the limiting equation? So here, I can increase x2 as much as I want. Here, remember, currently, x1 and x2 are 0. So how much can I increase x2 by? Not at all. I can't increase x2 by anything, because then x3 goes negative. Do you see that? The feasible solution that we're currently at is x1 is 0, x2 is 0. Therefore, I solve for x3, I get x3 is 0. And I solve for x4, I get x4 is 2. 
I'm pivoting over X2, right? That's the only thing I can pivot over to increase my optimization function, but I can't increase X2 at all without X3 going negative, okay? So that's, that's one form of degeneracy going on here. This is degenerate because the variable that we're pivoting over, we can't increase at all. We're still gonna do it and it's still gonna help us and some complicated things arise that I'll discuss. So let's pivot over, pivot over x2. My limiting equation is this one. So I replace x3 with, x, with x2 and I get x2 is equal to x1 minus x3. x4 is still two minus x1. My optimization function is x2, but x2 I, I want to rewrite in terms of the non-basic variables, x1 and x3. What's interesting is, is usually when you pivot, you move your feasible solution, right? In the, in the prior video, when we pivoted, we, um, we moved from this feasible solution to that one. Here, we're still gonna be at the same feasible solution after we pivot. So our non-basic variables, x1 and x3, better both be zero. And then what about our basic variables? x2 is zero and x4 is two. So even though I've pivoted, I've changed basis, I haven't moved along the polytope. I haven't increased my optimization function. Okay, let's keep going for a moment. What do I wanna do next? I wanna pivot along x1. By increasing x1, I can increase my optimization function. So we're gonna pivot along x1. What's the limiting equation? By this equation, I can increase x1 as much as I want. And by this equation, I can only increase x1 up to two. So x4 is gonna get removed from our um, basis. So I solve for x1 in that second equation, I get x1 is equal to two minus x4. And then x2 is equal to, I wanna write it in terms of x3s and x4s. So um, I plug in two minus x4 for x1. So this is two minus x3 minus x4. All right, and my optimization function, I plug two minus x4 in for x1, and I get two minus x3 minus x4. All right, so what solution am I at now? My non-basic variables, x3 and x4 are zero, and that allows me to solve for my basic variables, x1 and x2. They're both two. And this is actually the optimal solution. I can't increase x3 or x4 without doing worse. Finally, I'm gonna show you the ge geometry, okay? Our first feasible solution was right here, where x1 and x2 were both zero. This picture is in the x1, x2 plane. When I pivoted, I didn't change that first feasible solution. I just changed what basis I was representing it in. And then I pivoted two in the x, I pivoted again in the x1 direction. Oops, and pivoting in the x1 direction took me directly to the optimum right there. So yeah, since I had changed basis, pivoting in the x1 direction took me here, not just straight that way. So let me talk about this word de degeneracy. One way in which this is degenerate is here's a vertex of our polytope that has more half spaces colliding than you would expect. At this vertex, we have two half spaces colliding. At this vertex, we have two half spaces colliding. What's going on here is that at this vertex, we have three half spaces that pass through that point. 
Okay. So that's why we had to change from one basis that wasn't helpful to then change into a more helpful basis before we could continue in a productive manner. Questions so far? All right, this is one of the stickiest parts of the simplex algorithm. Sometimes you pivot and you change basis, but you don't change what vertex you're at. If you're not careful, you can do this in really bad ways, which is called cycling. I can change, still remaining at this vertex, I can change from basis A to basis B to basis C to basis D, and then I go back to basis A, okay? If you allow your computer program to do that, then you get stuck in this infinite loop where I'm changing from one basis to another, and then I circle back to the same basis, and then I keep following that loop again and again. That's not what happened here. We just changed basis once, and then we were able to move productively. So cycling is when you change basis and you get back to where you started. There are ways to prevent cycling. You sort of need to lexicographically order all of your variables, and you sort of need to keep track of which bases you've cycled through, and you don't return the ones that you've ever been to before. So you can, get, you can make it so that you never cycle, but you just have to be careful in doing so. And we'll, and we'll discuss that later. Any questions? All right, thanks.